I've just heard that uh, all the participants are in now uh, to our uh, virtual evening. So um, first off, I'd like to welcome the many hundreds of people that have joined us tonight for this latest in the series of Scottish Wildlife Trust Zoom presentations. Um, I've heard just a few minutes back that um, amazingly, more than 700 people registered for this event. So even if a good majority of that number uh, is with us at the moment, that's a staggering number of people that are virtually around um, our table or our computer screens tonight. So that's, that's really good news. But I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Scottish Wildlife Trust's North Group. Um, and before handing over to Dan Poplett, our speaker for tonight, just to say a few things about that group and to especially welcome, of course, members of that group who are with us for the Zoom presentation. So hello to everyone from the North that's here that I haven't actually seen in person now during the last 12 months. Um, I think you know, we've all been coping with the different challenges in different ways and none of the Scottish wildlife groups around the country has been meeting in person. But I, I'd like to congratulate the staff at the centre um, of the Trust for actually making possible these, these Zoom meetings. The, the North Group covers a huge area, the Highland mainland, for example, takes up a third of Scotland's mainland land surface. Um, our group is mainly active in the Inner Murray Firth area where we have our meetings and we will be, we hope very much, returning to those meetings in months to come. Um, for our North members, I'd like to assure you that we've got a full programme of events already agreed from the early autumn onwards through uh, next winter. So I hope we'll be able to be returning to that as meetings in person in the centre of Inverness near the, the river. Um, failing that, obviously, we'll make other arrangements for Zoom. So I won't bang on too much about our group, uh, other than to say that it's a real pleasure on behalf of our North members and our North committee to welcome you all here tonight. It's also a great pleasure to welcome my old friend, Dan Puplet, um, who I've been fortunate to know now for quite a good number of years, including when he used to work for Trees for Life and including way back when, when Dan was already getting pretty knowledgeable about tracks and signs, uh, I was able to be with them with a bigger group uh, looking out for signs of wolves and bears and lynx in Slovakia. So uh, looking to the future, you know, Dan will be very well prepared, I think, for whatever rewilding opportunities are coming up somewhere down the line there to know what, what he's seeing should any of these creatures be, be back in Scotland. But suffice to say, Dan is, is now very much, I would say, one of the, the leading experts in Scotland um, in terms of picking up on tracks and signs of a whole variety of wildlife. It's something he's built up over many years, continues to build up. And I know from conversations and sharing various photographs and things with them, it's something, as is the way with all good natural history, that he never tires of extending his knowledge. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Dan Puplet um, to the screen tonight. And I'll just hand over now to Dan. Dan. Great. Thanks very much, Kenny. Sorry, actually, sorry, Dan, to butt in. I should have said there, uh, so this is very rude, um, that um, I was asked to say that this webinar is being recorded. So if anybody objects to that, maybe leave the room at the moment. And the other thing is, um, if you're wanting to ask questions, um, then the easiest way to do that is to type them into the Q&A uh, function, which is at the the bottom slightly to the right of the screen and that will bring up something that you can put in your questions and at the end of the talk we'll have a Q&A session for for a wee while so 
Apologies, Dan, that was a very rude way of handing over to you, very inept way. So in a better way, I'll now seamlessly hand over to Dan Poplet. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. slides up. Great, so um, welcome again everyone and thanks so much for joining us this evening and to talk about tracks and signs of Scottish wildlife and as Kenny was saying it's something that I found really fascinating and still find really fascinating I'm imagining um, most if not everybody on, on this webinar is um, really interested in wildlife and um, the clues that they leave behind and um, just give a bit of an overview of some of the stuff that we're, um, we'll be talking about this evening, focusing very much on obviously tracks and signs of Scottish wildlife, but a lot of this stuff isn't exclusive to Scotland. And, um, but we'll, we'll look at some of the things that are often associated with our the kind of fantastic wildlife that we have here. And so we just have a bit of a, an overview of tracks and signs, the kind of the context of the role they played really in, in um, I guess the, the story of humanity over a long period of time. And then we'll look in more detail at actually the, some of the main different kinds of track and sign, like the, the different categories of tracks and signs, and then look specifically at some of the different species. And we'll only really be kind of, kind of scratching the surface in the way there's so many, we're, we're fortunate to have so many different species that leave um, signs behind. And we'll just have a look at some of the ones that are maybe more obvious or some of the more fun ones. And, and then at the end, there'll be time for questions and answers as well. And yeah, so, um, and here just as a, um, if you get into tracking, kind of get obsessed with substrates, there's certain particular kinds of ground that take tracks really well. And this kind of quite smooth, silty mud is, is particularly um, appetizing um, in a weird kind of way. And here we've got actually some woodcock tracks and uh, a part of a, uh, brown hair foot as well. But just, yeah, it's something I find really interesting about tracking and tracks and signs is that it is just such an ancient uh, human skill, you know, that as long as there's been humans, there's been um, uh, tracking and um, it's something that for th countless generations, humans have actually needed to do for survival to actually get food. And so somehow I think it's going kind to of hardwired into us and so for me, that's not, you know, I'm, I'm not out tracking to get food, but I'm um, using it in other ways as well. And a lot of other people too are, are using it in these ways too. So, so many different applications. Um, and the ones that really interest me are how, it, how tracking can apply to conservation and anyone can use it, you know, from um, professional ecologists to members of, of the public, citizen scientists who are wanting to um, help um, record and conserve species. I use it a lot in environmental education. It's a really great way to help people of all different ages really understand the behavior of, and um, physiology and the ecology of all these uh, different animals. And more broadly, um, nature connection as well. I think it's another avenue in to really switching on our senses and really starting to um, understand the wildlife around us, but just getting out and about in nature and really engaging with all of our senses, which as we all know is, is such a valuable thing. It involves some key different skills, including uh, pattern recognition. So I think it really fascinates me, the ability we have to recognize even quite kind of subtle shapes and patterns. People who are into, particularly say into birds or into insects or plants or whatever it might be, will start to pick up just very fine details and you know, recognize certain things from a distance even. And we all have that ability. Tracking also involves an element of a lot of deduction as well which I think is part of its appeal, this kind of CSI element, which um, is a really fun part of tracking. And also we really need to understand about animal behavior and the physiology of animals. And it really, one of the things, another thing I love about tracking is how it um, kind of really gets us to understand the wider landscape. And when we start, say, looking at a footprint and asking enough questions, before long we're going to have to understand about the, sometimes about the soil type in the area or the weather patterns or maybe the insects locally or birds or trees or all sorts so it's a really great gateway into natural history and becoming good at tracking and recognizing tracks and signs in particular and i should say track recognizing tracks and signs is one branch 
of tracking because there's many different branches there's others including actually being able to trail and follow the animal or age the tracks and all sorts lots of different skills but we're focusing here on identifying tracks and signs being able to do it well helps observer reliability so if we're doing it um, to record if a particular species in the area it's obviously really important that we, we know exactly what we're looking at some of the main categories of tracks and signs just sort of find it helpful to look at these broad um, categories so one one obvious one really be footprints we've got these really nice wood mouse prints um, bounding along just here feeding signs and that can vary from herbivore feeding signs like um, these are a variety of cones and nuts that have been fed on by various birds and mammals and it's through to you know, carnivore kill sites. And droppings, of course, um, often come up early in the list, especially if I'm working with kids. It's one of the first ones they'll name. And um, I think, Kenny, you might remember these bags of um, bear scats that we these we found in, in Slovakia. And there's something strangely... Um, satisfying about, hold, about holding this kilogram of, of bear dung in a bag, I'm not sure why. Um, and then also homes and resting places. Um, is a, this is actually a beaver lodge at uh, Agus Field Centre, took this some years ago. But they, these can obviously take all different shapes and sizes. And in kind of discarded parts of animals, whether that be feathers or bones, fur and other things, sloughed skins and um, and things like feathers and bones are whole areas of discussion in their own right. And I really love collecting all of these, like collecting feathers and bones and really trying to work out, you know, having a reference collection, say, of um, animal pelvises, mammal pelvises or whatever it might be. So, so then when I'm looking at a kill site or if I find something discarded, I know much more about the animals involved. And, um, and eggs and cases of all... all um, different kinds this is a um, common spotted cat shark but there's could be discarded um, bird eggs or uh, things like that trails and runs really nice badger trail here and a whole load of miscellaneous other signs things like rubs this or wallows like this red deer wallow here various scrapes more than we'll have time to look at but just to give a sense an overview of the variety really of signs that they're that are left behind and it's so interesting as well just to go out into the into the woods and or anywhere really where there are animals and recognize that within a very kind of short distance from where you stand there will be signs of probably multiple species and it just takes getting our eyes tuned in lot most of it or lots of it we won't see but um, it's great learning how to see more closely We'll have a, firstly have a look at um, some footprints and just a few tips on identifying some of the more um, com some of the more commonly encountered prints, and then some things which may be a bit scarcer but are interesting to know about. Um, this here, this um, well, I'm speaking to you maybe if you want to kind of guess or maybe you know what these are. But we've without scale, it can be harder to tell. But um, this is the context for this is it's just on a river bank by the River Findhorn. You've got these bird tracks and these mammal tracks here. These are actually fox tracks, which we'll look at more closely. When these aren't so well defined, but once you learn to recognize the key features, um, even when they're not so clear, they'll start to stand out more and more easily. And here we've got some heron footprints. And one of the distinctive things about a heron track is that that hind toe is kind of offset, you know, it's offline. If you follow a line through to the front toe, so um, yeah, it's so just a, a nice combination of species in one shot. Have a look at some of the really common stuff first. Not technically wildlife, but this is a domestic dog track on the beach. But it's it's useful to get to know dog tracks, and different breeds even will have different shaped feet. But um, even though it's probably the most commonly encountered in a lot of areas. Once we learn to recognize a dog track and why it's a dog track, it can help us tell it apart from um, some of our wildlife species. Generally speaking, canine tracks are, are relatively symmetrical. This one's kind of turned a bit in the sand, but they're relatively symmetrical, have this quite triangular palm pad and four toes that actually show in the, in the print with claws that pretty much always or usually register. 
And then looking at another canine here, you'll see, see a difference perhaps here. Maybe it's not obvious at first, but here it's a kind of a matter of looking at some of these lines um, with, this is a fox track. And there's this classic thing with a fox track of being able to draw an X through the track um, without it kind of, that line's a bit off there, but without it really being able to, without it cutting through the toe pads. Um, but the only thing to bear in mind is there's actually some breeds of dog that that applies to as well, like lurchers and collies have quite fox-like feet. Another one is drawing a line behind the front two toes. Um, um, these lines have slipped a little bit, but they, yeah, that, if I draw a line right behind those, it shouldn't cut into the, the rear toes here. That's some of the things, but the palm pad of a dog, and all, sorry, of a fox, we'll look at it here. You can see it's re relatively small. With a dog, it's quite big compared to the toes, individual toes. With a fox, it's a similar size to the surface area of the toes themselves. And now this is a front foot on the right here. On the left is a hind foot. And you'll see the palm pad on the hind foot is absolutely tiny. It's smaller, show even smaller than the toe pads. There's quite a few other things in fox tracks as well. For example, one of them would be the, the nails, the claws themselves tend to be pretty sharp compared to most dogs. And that shows in the track. And even the line of the claws, um, they tend to be either parallel or converge inwards with a the dog, they tend to splay it outwards a lot more. So say on this hind track, if you were to follow a line from all of these um, claws, it, eventually they would converge. Where this arrow is pointing, there's a a subtle kind of chevron shape which sometimes shows in the track um, and in fine silt as well you can even see the hairs the fact that foxes have hairy feet and um, will show up as well you don't really see that in most dog species dog breeds so that's a bit on canine so moving along to um, another group of carnivorous mammals so this one we can see rather than the canines tend to have more of an oval outline these here are a bit more symmetric, uh, sorry, a bit more circular and less symmetrical. If you look at this toe here, it's actually leading a bit further forward from that toe. Does that a little bit with dogs, but not as much. This, these are all features of um, feline tracks. And for the most part, you don't usually see the claws registering. They do, they can, you know, they, they will show sometimes, but off, more often you don't see them because of their retractable claws. And um, there's various other things around the shape, more of a kind of trapezoid palm pad. But this circular shape is um, quite a, a distinctive feature. Looking at the size of this, you'll see this is actually a pretty hefty track. And this was actually a, a lynx track in um, Slovakia in, in the middle of winter. And a really, really exciting thing to see, even though the chances of actually seeing the lynx itself were very, very remote. Just knowing that it had been by was um, really exciting. and. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely love to see some of these tracks in Scotland at some point. And here, as you can see a similar kind of, these are domestic cat tracks and circular again. And the, what's known as the negative space, whereas we saw that kind of X shape in the fox, it's more of a C shape, especially in this, this is a front foot of this domestic cat. And so this, I don't have any wild cat track pictures, but they're pretty, indistinguishable you know for practical purposes you can't tell them apart wild cats and domestic cats wild cats will be substantial tracks but then you get big domestic cats and, but it's nice to know you know if perhaps if you're in a very remote snowy part of the kangorns or somewhere in wildcat territory you may it may kind of switch you on to possible wildcats in the area and you could perhaps put some camera traps up or gather evidence other ways and so that was that's a bit on feline tracks and now um, looking at this, you can see this five-toed track here. So the weasel family overall, also known as the mustelids, they all have five toes on each foot. And they have, broadly speaking, they've got very similar features that everything from kind of weasels to stoats to pine martins up to otters. Badgers are slightly different from them, but still have five toes on each foot. This here is an otter track. This is a front left footprint of an otter. And we can see the, on the front foot, especially, it forms this really nice, wide, curving arc. If you look at this on the very right, that's the subtle indentation is actually what's 
technically it's the thumb toe, the equivalent of our thumb, on a lot of master lids, those, that toe doesn't really register that clearly a lot of the time. And it's quite common to find otter tracks and badger tracks and other master lids that look like they just have four toes. And that can actually be, that can be quite confusing. And so it could be easy to confuse an otter track with a dog in some situations if you just had part of the track. Um, often in otter tracks you'll see webbing, but that's not reliable. So one of the things that can help us is if we didn't, if you imagine we didn't have this thumb track showing on the right, the, the um, thumbprint, just looking at the symmetry of it, we can see it still, it would be really asymmetrical. The toe, the next toe along on the very right is quite a bit further forward than the very outermost toe. It's a really wonky track and dogs, as we saw, are much more symmetrical. That's one of the things. And also, so this is the kind of thing you may find along the edges of rivers, sandy bits of rivers or along the coast. The other thing is with this palm pad here, on an otter, the front part of that pad it tends to register quite deeply and that more deeply than it does with dogs. So they're just some tips if you find just part of an otter track and it's not clear whether it's a dog or an otter. Otter tracks also have the claws tend to merge into the kind of the toe print itself and it gives it this teardrop like shape. Now, no doubt this will be a familiar track to a lot of people. This is a classic badger track. And even if we didn't know as a badger, I really like looking at, this is where we can kind of look at animal physiology and start to think, you know, if we didn't know the species that have made this, but we were to look and see these really long claws, you can see the tips of the nails right out there. And you can start thinking, obviously, okay, why would this, this animal has obviously got long claws. What are the reasons for that? There could be several reasons. In the case of badgers, it's for digging, as we know. So they've got really well adapted feet for digging. And so this is a front right footprint of a badger. And you can see that thumb toe just down on the left, really, even though the print is actually registered quite deeply, still the thumb is quite high up and hasn't shown that well. Um, just a bit of a warning. I've got a few pictures here of um, not too grizzly, but some uh, roadkill animal um, feet are just um, it's sad, obviously, to see the animal by the side of the road. And at times I like to get pictures of the feet because it really helps with just understanding how the tracks are made. So in this case here, we've got a front left um, foot of a badger. You can see these incredible fleshy pads here. You can see the thumb at the top, how it's kind of held a bit higher off the ground than the other toes and these fantastic claws here. This, um, so that's the palm pad. This is the equivalent of the heel of our hand at the back here. And with badgers, you just see that on the front foot only. So that's one way of telling your front foot. They got longer claws, but sometimes they don't show. But if you have this pad registering, that's a good way to tell. So these ones here, you can see particularly with the front, this is another master lid, this arc with five toe prints on the top left and a set of four. And they, they often go along in this kind of loping gait. And this, in this case, this is a pine martin. The front foot, similar with otters as well, it has this wide arc, whereas the back foot um, looks, this actually looks look more dog-like, like a tiny miniature dog with two toes further forward and one back. But generally the principle of, if you see something with five toes in an arc, you can, um, it's quite likely to be a master lid of some kind. And then using things like your location and uh, you know, looking at the range map and things like that can help you narrow it down a bit. And another um, very iconic Scottish mammal, these are red squirrel tracks. So these are the, the prints from the front feet and really, again, really like seeing these deep, um, claw prints, and if you look at the, the squirrel's front feet, they've got these really sh quite, quite sharp curved claws, obviously well adapted to climbing up trees. And they have a tiny, um, they have, as with other rodents, just four toes on the front feet, five on the back, but they do have a tiny vestigial thumb. This is um, at the back of these these are kind of heel pads, these pair here and on the very left is a tiny speck, which is a kind of vestigial thumb that's useful for, for tracking nerds if you want to find out, you know, if you have one print and you want to find if it's a front right or a front left. And this is it closer up so you can see the, these incredible long claws and 
um, this vestigial thumb just here. And this is then all together, the typical um, gait that you'll see a, a squirrel moving in and a lot of rodents as well, like the wood mouse pictures we saw earlier on, the wood mouse prints, where the front feet have landed, but then it's um, then bounding along and the hind feet land, and then you'll usually see a series like that. With rabbits and hares, it's similar, but then more often with rabbits and hares, these two toes at the back, two feet at the back will be a bit more offset, not always, but often. And so it, this is a typical rabbit or hare pattern. In this case, this is actually a, a mountain hare and really difficult to tell apart from brown hares. And I usually just go on um, kind of elevation and location right, right at the top of a mountain. You're going to expect it to be a mountain hare, unsurprisingly. And, and then when it comes to hares versus rabbits, they can be, there's kind of subtle features that can help you tell them apart, but general size is um, a useful one. And it's often said if the print, if you could fit it um, within the size of a kind of a standard small matchbox, if it's smaller than that, then it's most likely a rabbit. And if it's bigger, it'd be a hare. And the hares, their feet, their hind feet can spread out quite a lot. And sometimes you've seen these, which look absolutely huge, um, just because the toes spread in deep substrate. And this is seen, and this is again, um, this is along the, the Five Sisters of Kintail. If anyone, I'm sure some of you will know um, that range. And so these are mountain hair prints. You can see these ones are coming towards us. So again, with these two, two paired feet, or the two in a line rather, the front feet and then the hind feet overtaking them. That's a really typical um, way for these rabbits and hares known as the Lagomorphs. It's a typical way for them to move. And then moving on to another group again. So the ungulates or the hoofed mammals. And um, so we have obviously the various species of deer and as well as sheep. And um, there's, there's not time to go into detail about how to tell all the different deer in, across Britain. We have um, six different deer species, fewer in Scotland, but there's this here is a red deer track. It has a very quite substantial blocky look and it's just really quite big and quite chunky. Um, and roe deer tend to be quite a bit smaller and more heart shaped. And we should mention as well sheep as well, which can be confused with deer. They're much more rounded at the ends and really asymmetrical. The deer tracks are slightly asymmetrical with a deer. One of these cleats is much, is substantially longer than the other and they have these kind of blunt rounded ends. Now here's a um, another animal which this isn't a this is the clearest track is in very kind of hard crisp snow but it's the kind of situation you know is often the case that we don't have perfect tracks and but we can still see the two main toes here of the two separate parts of the hoof. Um, I find it really interesting that the, the hoof is actually the equivalent of our um, middle finger and our ring finger and the, and the hoof itself is actually the nail so it's kind of on tip to uh, this here so we can see those two bits but then also these huge dew claws which are bits coming out of the effectively the wrist and um, so this is actually a wild boar track and so this even when it's walking along the dew claws are so big that they'll make an impression to the ground and this is an animal that, we, that is certainly back in in Scotland, various um, escapes from places mean that it's fairly well established in certain areas. And here, this is one that was in captivity at Trees for Life's Dundragon Estate quite a number of years ago as part of a, um, a project to kind of get them to basically regenerate or disturb the ground and allow natural regeneration. The point of including it here is you can see the, this massive dew claw there. It tends to be much higher up with most deer. With roe deer, as they're running along or in deep ground, the dew claws may also show as well. So there can be kind of room for confusion, but with a, a wild boar, they're just out really far to the sides. And now moving 
away away from the kind of the upland areas this is right down on the coast and a whole other group of mammals again you can see this this is right by the sea you can see this broad furrow here with these arcs with claw marks and so that's a, a seal trail as you can imagine a seal dragging itself along um, this is a, a gray seal in this this case pretty sure this is gray seal. And then some more footprints. So, well, so we've covered a few mammals, but not, not a lot of time to go into detail on birds, but just I like looking at some of the ones that are really commonly encountered when we're out and about. These ones are about se seven centimeters or so tip to tip. These are crow, carrion crow tracks. And the corvids, the crow family generally, um, one of the features you tend to get is that these two inner toes here are really close together. And one exception is jays are a bit different. All the toes are kind of quite close together, but um, with, the, with carrion crows, with rooks, with hoodie crows, jackdaws, magpies all have a similar kind of setup and they're subtle, subtler ways to kind of tell those apart. Rooks and carrion crows are really hard to tell apart. But even seeing that, you can narrow it down and know that it's a, a member of the crow family, often have a lot of ridges along the toes as well. And here, zooming out, this is, not as clear, but on the very left, you can also see this pattern, two toes close together, the right foot of the corvid. But looking at the scale, this is a really chunky print. And this is a raven print. And actually on the right here, these more, much more widely splayed chunky ones, a buzzard print. And this was at um, a Gralic site out in Glen Africa, so basically where a deer had been shot and you know, its um, entrails removed. And often you'll find the, the prints of scavenging animals around them. And uh, game birds generally, so game birds and waders will have a different foot structure, so you don't tend to see the a long hind toe. It's often either not visible or just this tiny little dot. These are pheasant prints, which are a really common ones to find. Bigger and more robust than the woodcock we saw earlier on. And then these, from a distance, really hard to tell, but this was just in context. This was at um, kind of later in the day at a site where black grouse were lecking. So, um, which I'm sure some of you know, lecking is this kind of um, mating display that the males will do. And so there's a lot of activity around this spot. So typical game bird tracks, anyway, with three toes facing forward and just a tiny reduced hind toe. And much bigger and less distinct, but this was um, this was in Slovakia as well. Uh, Capacali tracks, um, really quite really substantial. And again, the kind of situation where you might see you can't see a lot of clarity in the track, but and once you know the features to look for, we can narrow that down to a game bird. And then looking at the size and the context, we can get the species. And then moving on from birds, this is. Um, you might want to, some of you maybe may well know or maybe want to have a guess. This is one of those things and it kind of highlighted to me. I think it's the same. I'm sure maybe you've had the experience when perhaps if someone's pointed out a particular plant, I certainly have this a particular plant or insect or something that's new to me. I start seeing it all the time or seeing it much more often. And obviously it's been there all along. I'm just learning to see it. Same case, same situation with these tracks here. When I was first shown these, I thought, oh, I hadn't noticed them before, and now see them pretty much each year. And so this is an edge of a kind of silty puddle going left to right. These are actually toad tracks. And you can see the um, this kind of K-shaped prints. You can imagine the front feet, the way toads walk along with their feet turned inwards. And these are the, the hind feet with the tips of the toes going in an arc. So come, come the spring, I tend to find them a lot. So if you're along a path, Kind of muddy puddles that are drying out and with silt on the edge. Keep an eye out for these. It's a really nice one to see. That's a that's actually a different toad. I didn't manage to track that toad to the end. And then looking a bit just briefly at some trails as well. So different animals will leave various kinds of runs and trails. And this is actually a, a beaver trail. Um, in this is in Napdale, just going into the water. Could be subtle at first, but when you when you look closely, you can see it's pretty obvious that something's been going in and out of the water here. 
then moving on to feeding signs. Um, as I mentioned, for so many different kinds of feeding signs you might come across, we'll look at some of the ones that are, um, you may encounter more often. So we can see these, these are Sitka spruce cones, but they've been nibbled really, really neatly and almost like they're kind of shaved clean with very little left at the tip. So these, that's, this is the work of a wood mouse in this case. You'll tend to find things like this underneath sheltered areas. Like this was underneath a piece of old corrugated iron, if you remember rightly, but even under, say, a root buttress in a tree or an old abandoned burrow or something like that. And again, just thinking of like the, the behavior of um, these particular animals, wood mice being mainly nocturnal, they really don't want to be just eating out in the open when there's tawny owls around. It's just kind of a bit suicidal, so they'll make sure they're undercover. Um, so the location can be helpful, and even just based on the location, we can say, okay, it's definitely not a squirrel hiding under a piece of corrugated iron. But here, this is, a, am sure, a really familiar bit of sign for a lot of people. These are squirrel, bits of squirrel feeding sign on some Scots pine cones. Unfortunately, we can't reliably tell red from grey squirrels just from the cones. But if you're in, air, in an area, say, of pure reds, then you can, you know, it's a reliable indicator that they're there. And uh, this is one of those bizarre um, kind of bits of tracking trivia about looking at the angle of the bites, see where the scales have been bitten off by the squirrel, um, can give you an indication. It's not always, not always visible because some squirrels tear them off, but it can give you an indication of if the squirrel is left-handed or right-handed, which I found was quite, um, quite bizarre. But basically, it's the way the squirrel handles the cone. So if it's right dominant, which most squirrels are, it will be rotating the cone with its right paw. And, and the way you can tell is if that angle goes from the, the right up to the left, if the lowest part is the right, then it's a right-handed squirrel. This one's the left-hander. But some amateurs, so it would be great to be able to see these two cones and say, oh, there's definitely two squirrels at least in the area. But um, unfortunately, it could be just one ambidextrous squirrel. But it's a nice bit of kind of animal behavior, I think. To, know about. More cones here but dealt with in a different way. We can see these have got splits right down the scales here. So this is crossbill feeding sign and they've got this that incredible overlapping bill adapted to prise open the scales and get a nutritious seed inside. That's a nice one to look out for in, especially in old pine woods. And this here is on, that was on Scott's pine cone, but these are on larch cones. And this was, this kind of caught my eye. This was in a part of Glen Affric. And because larch cones, um, if you're familiar with larch, the cones tend to stay on the twig, even after the twigs died, you know. So if you see larch cones off the tree, there's something kind of going on there. And these, these are relying on the snow with seeds scattered around. Looking at them more closely, the scales had splits right down them, which all indicators of crossbill activity again. And we were lucky to see these crossbills actually later on came round to the same spot. A um, bit of feeding sign on hazelnuts, which are very nutritious and sought after where they occur. Mice and voles tend to, can't get their jaws all around, tend to eat in from the side. And mice will leave a, a messy edge Around here, see all this kind of damage around the edge. And um, voles tend to eat more neatly. It's to do with the way they, the vole will stick its face right in the nut. And it's basically the, the way that they handle it. But squirrels will do it differently. Their jaws are big enough to get right round the nut. Here you can see the hole here where it's, this is a stored hazelnut the squirrels dug up. And then it's split it open. So the, if you see a clean split nut, that's a good indication of the squirrel. Incredibly, their jaw, the lower mandible, the lower jaw, isn't properly fused at the base. It's got a piece of ligament, so they can actually separate their incisors and pop the nut open, which um, I just always think would be a great party trick. I kind of wish I could do that. And no prizes for guessing um, this, this feeding sign. This is just fantastic to see this beaver sign here. And obviously, these kind of hourglass shaped, partly two trees with these chips below them. And then this is a closer up look. These are some smaller sticks where you can actually see the, the gnaw marks where they've been getting the cambium off to eat that nutritious inner bark. 
And another fairly common sign where badgers occur, these are badger, what are known as snuffle holes. So the badger will get right in there. Um, and if you sometimes if you put your finger inside, you can actually feel or even see the kind of cone shape of the badger's nose that's been stuck in. And you might even see the hole where the earthworm was that it's sucked out. And earthworms from a really substantial part of their diet. A handy thing as well is that if you look in this kind of fine, depending on the soil, but often if it's a nice kind of fine soil, it's quite common to find a badger print in there just to confirm that's what it is. The um, rabbits also dig in a way that can look quite similar to this and they do it, sometimes they do it to get to roots, but they'll also do it as a territorial marking. They basically leave droppings and urinate on this pile. One clue will love it will be, will be that it kind of smells like kind of weirdly like sweaty digestive biscuits the best description with a rabbit and also you're likely to see rabbit droppings on there but with a badger it's a, it doesn't have those kind of features and then scaling it up this is a real kind of a principle with tracking is that if you see any sign of kind of disturbance or um any kind of action or impact if you kind of think about okay what what kind of force what kind of mechanism would it have taken to have made that and looking at these huge clods of earth that have been turned up, badgers are pretty strong, but generally when you see this over a big area, you think, okay, that's too much for a badger to realistically do. And so this is typical wild boar sign. And then looking at some um, feeding like predation signs. So on, on the left here, we have these feathers. These are wood pigeon feathers. And one of the things we can see about them is that they've actually been broken or sheared here at the tip. So that's an indication of a carnivorous mammal that's sheared through and things like foxes, pine martens, other carnivores will use the side teeth known as carnassials, which acts kind of like shears and cut through these feathers. And with this one here on the right, these are, this is part of a pheasant wing. These are some pheasant primaries, like the lead flight feathers. And there's a whole line of them being sheared. And you can tell if it's a longer line of feathers, it's a, more of a clue that it's probably a, a mammal with a longer jaw, like a fox. So a pine marten wouldn't really be able to take off that chunk in a wanna. So you can kind of start to narrow it down. Because of the location of this pigeon, I suspected it was a pine marten, but I couldn't say 100% for sure. And, um, and the other things we can't say 100% for sure is that those mammals actually killed these birds, because the birds could have died some other way and the mammal will scavenge them, but what we do know is that they've been eaten by a mammal. And then we can compare that to, this is a typical sparrowhawk kill site, where you get this a bit of an explosion of feathers, lots plucked out, um, and the tips of the feathers typically will be intact rather than sheared through. And quite often you might see some damage further up the quill here, or some of the, the barbs, the fine parts of the feathers, a bit creased, but you won't see them cut through at the base. This is something that's quite common to find even in gardens or often in the woods. And another bit of feeding sign, the, the bird's breastbone. And this is where I find it interesting to kind of collect different breastbones of birds. Um, if you get into that, because then you can have a reference collection. But here, um, this one, you can see these notches, which is really typical um, indicator that a raptor, a bird of prey has been feeding on this, um, on this bird and it's a really common thing to find with raptor kills this is quite extreme i think this was a because of where it was probably a peregrine that ate this but um this is a grouse breastbone but um, sometimes it's a bit more subtle but you even see it on sparrowhawk um, kills even with tiny birds like blackbirds and stuff you'll see this kind of damage and it's completely different in a way some other feeding sign on this comfrey here this is another one of those ones when someone pointed it out to me I thought, oh, I'm going to keep looking for this. If you see this tiny hole towards the top of the flower, um, I imagine some of you may know or may want to guess, but this is, um, yeah, the, the more I look at comfrey flowers, I tend to see loads and loads with this. This is actually bumblebee feeding sign. So, you know, there's quite a few different bumblebee species. Some have longer tongues, some have shorter tongues, and they've adapted to and evolved alongside particular flowers, so the comfrey will be visited more by the longer-tongued bumblebees, but some of the shorter-tongued ones will kind of cheat and just bite a hole in the side and get the nectar that way. 
So um, it's a nice one to look out for. We move on to um, droppings. And um, here, so a bit on bird droppings, which are probably quite well known to be fairly white. So that's the, the uric acid content in the dropping. Carnivorous birds, um, like birds of prey, and as well as owls and herons and things like that, um, they tend to produce pellets. So they regurgitate pellets, which have a lot of the solid matter. So the droppings tend to be quite liquid, but also because of the high protein content, it basically means a lot of uric acid. So they tend to be really white and paint-like. Um, quite a lot of raptors, not all of them, but quite a lot will actually squirt them out the back. These are actually golden eagle droppings quite on quite a high hilltop. And there's a whole load of these sprayed out quite a distance. Um, some other bird, owls will drop them down, falcons do as well. So there's ways you can tell, not always reliably, but you can get a good idea of what birds have been there. And this is a, always a, a joyful sight, some otter sprints. So, um, yeah, so th this one on the right is really fresh. I was actually lucky to see this otter shortly before, shortly afterwards. It's so fresh, it's got a tiny bubble there, which is a, a good indicator. This one's a bit older. With otter sprints, you tend to see quite a lot of fish bone content. Although I have found things like a, a mallard duckling foot in a otter sprint before, but often bone content. And um, they have this smell, which is often compared to jasmine tea, which I find quite accurate. It's like kind of fishy jasmine tea. And they use particular features, often prominent features along a watercourse to deposit these droppings. Carnivores, as a, as a kind of rule of thumb, they tend to have elongated droppings, herbivores, more pellet-like. There's always exceptions, but that's a good starting point. And this is a typical fox dropping. It's got lots of fur in it, bits of feather, in fact, as well, and a twisted end. And a much smaller here, also very coiled and twisted. This is much smaller. This is actually a pine martin dropping. There's times when it's hard, like impossible to tell reliably by eye, um, pine martin and fox cats apart, but sometimes by size, um, you can do. There's things around smell as well, but it's really um, not a good idea to get close up, particularly to fox droppings. They can carry some quite dangerous pathogens, but, um, but fox droppings are pretty rank, even from a distance. And depending on the content, you can sometimes tell which it is, but when they're really small and spirally like this, um, it's a good indicator of pine martin. And there's other features we won't have time to go into, but stoats, for example, you won't usually find in these kind of locations, like in the middle of a forest track, where you'd usually see fox or pine martin scat. These um, rowan berries all kind of look just semi-chewed. Like this is quite a common thing to find in late, in pine martin areas, a common thing to find in late summer, early autumn when the rowan berries are out, and they seem to just gorge on them and um, don't really digest them that well, but you find these amorphous splats of rowan. I've seen it with yew berries and others as well. And then uh, this, if you find this right in a, a kind of a dug pit, so this latrine, these are badger droppings, badger scat. And they will actually leave their droppings just out and about, not always in the latrine, but this is a typical place to find them, often quite a few latrines together. They smell a bit like TCP. And these pellet-like droppings of quite fibrous looking ones. These are hair, in this case, mountain hair droppings. Again, it's location that helps tell them apart. Um, and bigger, usually bigger than rabbit droppings. Sometimes vaguely pointed at the end, but not in the same way as deer, which have a look in a second more of a point. So you might have spotted in that previous one, just um, right next to it, there's this little curved dropping. That's actually a ptarmigan. Dropping. And then here we've got left to right ptarmigan, red grouse, and black grouse. And um, I've seen Kappa, Kappa Kaley droppings, but for some reason didn't collect it when I, uh, when I saw it, which I'm a bit gutted about. So if anyone's got any donations, I'd, I'd welcome a Kappa droppings. And then these are typical deer droppings. And um, they can be hard, species wise, can be hard to tell apart, but location can help. And uh, they often have this little point at the end, kind of a nipply point. These are road deer in this case. Something you might find in the house. This is a bit more left field, but these tiny white spots. Um, 
here, often find you might see brown spots on the windowsill. If you've got a pale windowsill um, where house flies, you can see they're dropping. So these white ones, which look a bit like um, bird poo, are actually uh, spider droppings. And so often uh, right below where a spider's hanging out, I think in this case, a, a daddy long leg spider. Um, yeah, you find these little white spots. And then a quick one on pellets. So as I said before, pellets are regurgitated matter really, and they tend to be pretty dry. And I'm sure some of you all have had the pleasure of pulling apart an owl pellet. And it's really fascinating to you know, like look at the bones and what the owl has been eating. It's just give a sense of the, some of the range of pellets we can get. And I really like this, this colossal uh, golden eagle pellet. And here, these are a few more eagle pellets together. It's really huge. I'm just aware of time, so I just whiz, whiz few, through a few more of these, but looking at um, homes and resting places. Um, here we have, this is under a really ancient oak tree, a badger set that's probably been there for quite a long time. So it's actually used the roots kind of as the roof almost at the entrance to this set, but they often have quite a wide, almost D-shaped profile with a, with a furrow um, kind of coming out of it, especially in this case of its sandy soil. And yeah, all different kinds of burrows, obviously, but um, there'll be various things like rabbit burrows, a bit smaller. They sometimes say if, if it's big enough to stick your head in, definitely don't recommend you do stick your head in, but foxes and badgers are that kind of size. But just bearing in mind that rabbit burrows can collapse a bit and open up a bit wider. And here in the fork of this tree, we've got this squirrel dray. This is a red squirrel dray. It's quite a football, kind of football size and shaped structure. We'll often have needles or leaves still attached. And at times they can be confused with bird's nests, especially from below. It's quite typical to find them wedged right against the, the trunk. They're not always about, usually about six, eight meters up, something like that. This is not a, not a dray or a nest or anything, but could, could be uh, forgiven for mistaking it for one. These uh, structures you often see in birches, sometimes in Scots pine too. These are known as witches' brooms. And it's a kind of gall, so it's this abnormal growth that's triggered by, a, in this case, by a fungus called taphrina. And the fungus infects the tree, and the tree grows this really dense growth of twigs, and they can really look like nests or drays. So I always find it interesting, in, interesting in its own right, and to kind of get your eye in for things that aren't necessarily an animal sign just to sort of help tell them apart. And here we can see along the, the edge of this burn just here and under the roots of this ash tree overhanging the burn just down to the right, a bit of otter spring. There's a faint run here. So this is a, an otter halt as an otter's den is, is known. And then this is something else that's pretty common to find in certain areas of woodland for sure a scraped back patch, often quite close to a tree or a group of trees, and um, usually maybe about 40 centimetres across or something like that. That's a roe deer bed or couch, and they like to scrape the, scrape the soil back. Looking in really closely, it's really hard to see in this picture, but if you were to get in closely, there's actually quite a few hairs in there as well, um, roe deer hairs. Um, so towards the end of you know, coming into spring when they're shedding their winter coat, we often see that. So just a quick um, recap, maybe um, sometimes I'll do this with kind of in the chat and things like that, but maybe we can, to make sure we've got time for questions, I'll just flick through a few of these and see if you can um, recall or if you maybe know already what these ones are. So here we've got the cones, Scots pine cones with the splits down the side. These are crossbill feeding sign. This bird track really commonly found in this case, about seven centimeters long, two toes really close together is a corvid track, in this case, a case of crow. And droppings in a latrine and um, kind of smelling a bit like a mixture of TCP and earthworms, I suppose. It's a nice badger latrine. 
I'm just going back to these tracks here as well with this big area of negative space and really small palm pads. These are typical fox tracks. And this one, which we didn't show this particular picture before, but this is actually coming towards us. And you see these K-shaped prints facing inwards with the curves behind. So these are toad tracks. And this is really, really nice silt. This is kind of mouth-watering silt for, if you're into tracking. And actually right next to it, we've got the hind foot of a squirrel there and the front foot of a squirrel just above and to the left, the red squirrel. So this is kind of a double mouth-watering track encounter. And then the circular cat prints with the C-shaped negative space. And just wrapping up some of the, the key points really on, on tracking and tracks and learning tracks and signs. Um, I just think it's, if anyone into natural history, even if you're not specifically into getting into tracking in depth, it's a really valuable part of the overall toolkit of learning more about the, just the fantastic wildlife that's around us. And just keeping in mind that tracks and signs are absolutely pretty much everywhere, especially when we're out and kind of out in nature or in green places. Um, and yeah, so if we look closely enough, we might, we'll bound to find something, even if we don't know what it is. And that's kind of part of the fun is trying to solve those, solve those puzzles. Um, and it gives us this much deeper understanding of the natural world when we really start to engage with tracking. As I said before, it just really helps us understand more about wildlife and the environment around like around where these animals live and so many different aspects of the natural world and um, and also one thing i find really valuable about it is just how it can be applied to conservation efforts so really um, um getting a sense of what species are around us obviously is an essential part of helping protect them so yeah so just to say thanks very much i'm really um open to so any questions and just to say as well if you um into social media and stuff remember to do keep an eye on the scottish wildlife trust and um also if you're interested in finding out about more stuff that i'm doing tracking wise and other things do do feel free to get in touch and yeah so thanks for listening i'd be really interested to hear if there's any questions thanks a lot dan that was <clears throat> a tour de force around so many different types of creatures and I don't think I'll look at digestive biscuits again in the same way after your oh, comment yeah. about rabbits and marking places and sweaty oh. digestive biscuits or not that I'm a great fan of TCP but TCP mixed with earthworms is pretty exotic kind of <laughs> cocktail of smells but just great to see that and very envious of your toad track encounters because uh, that's that's quite special. Um, we've had quite a number of questions as the talk's gone on um, and people have been sometimes liking particular questions that they might have asked themselves so that means we've got a kind of sequence I'll if it helps you read out some of them from the the top down so to speak yeah, uh, an early question was Paddy Zaccario was saying he walks in uh, I, I walk in the mornings and often beside a loch and that I pass find the fresh skins of frogs have been skinned completely, leaving only the ends of their legs with hands on. Skins are fresh and wet as if they've, it's only just been done. What is it that's doing this? Otter, pine marten? Oh, great, great question. Um, I guess depending on where the location and what animals are on, it's a pretty classic otter thing to do. And I've seen it with um, toads as well, where they'll, particularly with toads, because you know they've got these kind of toxic glands, so they'll peel them kind of inside out. But you do see it with frogs as well, and it can be carnage. Although I have been told by someone, and I haven't seen this reliably myself, someone has told me that herons do it too. And so don't quote me on that, because I want to double check that that's really the case. But I love kind of hearing these new bits of information, so it's going to get me kind of looking out for herons doing it more. I, I um, Yeah, I'm not sure about that, because I could just imagine a heron would just scoff it whole. But usually when I see that, I associate that with um, otters. And um, polecats, though, in areas where are much scarcer, of course, but they are um, in areas where there are polecats, they're known to be quite a specialist of eating amphibians as well. But I suspect I put my money on it being otters where you've seen them. Probably. Thanks. And 
Next question is David Bentley. Is there any mobile apps that you'd recommend to aid identification in the field? Of um, tracks? Um, I don't use any myself, so I couldn't, yeah, I, I, not one I could kind of recommend or disrecommend. I know that the Mammal Society do have something called um, the Mammal Tracker app, which I've got a feeling it's to do with, it's certainly to do with recording. I haven't um, looked at it, but it'd be worth checking out because it may have some stuff on the tracks and signs themselves. Um, for myself, maybe because I'm maybe just a bit more old school, I just um, perhaps there's some really good reference guide, guides and books around and, and also various people I've learned with or whatever, which have helped me the most. But that's not to say there's not a good app out there. It's just I haven't really discovered or used it myself. Mm. And there's the kind of... Um partial question oh it's gone now actually um okay uh donna atkinson um has asked and i think somebody else asked something similar so they're now merged into one is a frog print different from a toad print they're um very they're so similar they can be really hard to tell apart especially the individual print and you'd need really almost a perfect substrate to be able to see these kind of subtle differences on them, which I, for my, you know, for myself, I don't find it super practical just looking at the individual print. What I do find more useful is um, the actual gait that they're moving in. So typically, toads will walk and foxes will hop, although both of them will do the opposite, if that makes sense. But if I find quite a long string of tracks that are just walking along for a while, I, I be really confident saying that that was a toad. And if I saw a, a kind of stretch, you know, of them hopping, sometimes even shorter steps, sh I'm sorry, shorter sections of them hopping along that's um, pretty reliably frog just because of the way they move. There are features in the toes, but it gets kind of quite kind of detailed and technical. So I find the, the gait the most useful thing. Mm. Hence, I think, uh, I think you know him as well, actually, I've got a friend Gordon McClellan, who uh, does his business as Creeping Toad for environmental yeah. education. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good way of thinking of it. Yeah. Lorna Wills Williamson was wondering, how are prints measured, i.e. are claw tips included? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Yeah, we, I didn't have kind of time to go into measuring prints and gates, but that's... So with mammal prints, you only measure it from the kind of the back of the print to the tips of the toes, and you don't include the claws. And the reason for that is because it's it's quite unreliable whether or not the claws register. So as an example, cat prints, sometimes they register, mostly they don't. Even with badgers, which have these colossal big claws, there's times where weirdly they don't really show, obviously, or same with other mammals as well. So it's more reliable with mammal tracks to measure it just the um, from the tip of the toe to the, the heel of the palm pad. Um, or sorry, the, the back of the palm pad here. With bird tracks, it's different. Bird tracks, you actually do measure the, the claws, so you tip to tip, because they're so much more reliable to see in the track. Another kind of future resources question, Catherine Green is saying, can you recommend a good book describing tracks and signs? Yeah, there's one that I'd recommend most, actually, is overall, it's a, a friend of mine, I've got it right here, um, this one here, it's called Track and Sign. It came out just really recently as Hot of the Press by John Ryder, who's a friend and a fantastic tracker. He's based in the south of England. And um, this came out recently. And this, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, is the best track and sign book you could possibly get for the British Isles. So I definitely recommend that. It's really packed with good stuff. Right, so hot yeah. of the presses, yeah. And also, if you're... A cheeky plug if it's of interest. The Field Studies Council guides a um, year or two ago wrote this one on bird tracks and signs, British bird tracks and signs. This is more kind of lightweight in the field one. So, and the Field Studies Council also do other you know, natural history related guides too. So, that's a couple. If you were to get one book, though, I'd recommend uh, John Ryder's one. Excellent. No, I hadn't heard of that one. I'll be seeing yeah, really, that really out. Really, yeah. Let's talk. Claire Duffy. Um, saying in late summer last year i repeatedly saw droppings i think fox containing the remains of berries that grow in the brambles which lie in the walkway would it have been a fox and um, it's pretty like if it was the foxes definitely eat brambles and you definitely i've definitely seen 
bits of bramble, you know, brambles in fox scat. So um, it's yeah, really likely. Obviously, depending on the size and stuff like that. But if you if it's of the right kind of size, usually with size of droppings, it's the the kind of the thickness rather than the length that's the best indicator. But um, if you're familiar with fox droppings and you're seeing brambles in it, it's, yeah, I'd be pretty certain it's a fox. Anne Thompson was surprised at the size of the wild boar print. She reckoned it was around 15 centimetres long, uh, but she felt that seems quite long, but I guess she gets yeah. a big boar. That's it. It's probably pretty big boar. And also to bear in mind as well, because that print was actually, that was in really crisp, frozen snow. It was like a crust on top. It had broken through. And tracks can be deceptive. If you, the best way to measure a track is actually right at the base of the print. Because you can get all kind, even in mud or wherever, because you can get all kinds of distortion where the, the foot is going in the substrate and leaving, meaning that the top of the track can look quite a bit wider. And because of that crisp cross, the way that bore track broke meant that it looked really big. So I think it was a big bore, but the kind of substrate exaggerated it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. the next question Ashlyn Taverner is one about uh, frogs and toads, I think has already been answered. Um, Although actually Jackie Robinson is now top of the question list. Do red squirrels use communal drays in winter or are they solitary? They tend to be, as far as I know, and someone might correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, um, they, they tend to be solitary unless it's, I mean, now we're coming into the breeding season. So a mother and a young will hang out together. But um, yeah, I could be, could be wrong on that. I always... Um, always thought or think that they use most of the time they'll use solitary drays. Penny McKee's question <clears throat> is uh, probably a tricky one in terms of scents and stuff and not getting too close to stuff uh, but she says she lives on outskirts of city can you tell if poos on lawns or fox stroke badger both seen here or from dogs belonging to naughty residents and Colin McLeod reckons that often domestic cats don't bury their poo either so oh, okay uh, yeah, yeah. Poo ID, you know uh, droppings id and city lawns quite yeah. a tricky delicate business really yeah yeah with with dogs um generally especially if it's in a city is less likely to be eating any kind of um wild prey and and even even from a distance if you kind of this is where it gets a bit grim but if you break it open with a stick there's a particular kind of Grim. I've got quite a strong stomach for breaking open animal scat, but when it comes to dog, it still always turns on stomach. But just breaking it open, you can see that grim kind of consistency. Mm. And I try not to get in too close, but you can probably smell it. With um, badgers, less likely to be deposited just on its own on the lawn, but it is possible. Um, so yeah, they will sometimes, but less likely. And in fox, you'll tend to get more of that elongated shape with a twist to it. In a city, though, they might be eating they will be eating stuff that's not wild prey, so it can be confusing. But then, um, yeah, it's usually the consistency that tells dog. With uh, cats, cats tend to have more rounded, blunt end cat droppings, and they're with lots of small segments usually kind of compressed together. So it's a different kind of structure to the canine droppings usually. Mm. Adele and Dan Hersey are wondering if you can tell how old the track is, or how can you tell? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really, it's a difficult art and it's, I find it really interesting. I mean, there's people, I know um, trackers in, in the States and elsewhere who are really experienced at this and can can tell them kind of pretty accurately and with practice, it's possible. Um, one of there's some good rough and ready ways are just looking at um, weather patterns. And so say, for example, if you find a footprint and there may be, you know, if you look at rain around, rain drops around the print, but perhaps there's none in the print itself. And then you can start thinking, okay, when did it last? When did it stop raining last? And this is an example actually of how tracking can kind of get us more aware of and connected to the wider environment. Because we start thinking, okay, I didn't notice the weather. Maybe next time I will notice and journal it or whatever. But that's one way is to look at, you know, the, say the presence or absence of raindrops or other kinds of weathering in the track. Um, and another way as well, really kind of quick, rough and ready way, if you see a footprint, say in a, in a bit of mud or a particular substrate, if you do a mark next to it with your thumb, you can often see as tracks age, the color kind of changes. And when they're fresh, there'll be a particular kind of color depending on the substrate or even a particular texture. 
So you can see the similarity of the mark you've made to the track, or similarity or difference. And it's, again, really hard to age accurately, but it can give you a rough idea. There's people, the people who do age tracks really accurately. I mean, some of the best trackers in the world would say the bush people in the Kalahari or um, some of the Australian Aborigines and, and others who have been doing this since they were tiny kids on, on a particular kind of substrate. And they get to know it so well that they can do it within a, a short window of time. But that's some kind of easy to use tips. Dominic Andrews is wondering if mammals change their gait in deep snow. Oh, that's yeah, that's a really good question as well. Um, they do for sure, and the, and we didn't have time to go into gates much at all generally. So the way certain animals move, whether it's a walk, a trot, or a, a run, or hopping, and other kinds of gait, can tell us a huge amount. Um, very briefly, different animals will have what's known as a baseline gait, so it's their typical way of walking or moving. Um, so say for a fox, it's generally trotting, for a deer it's usually walking. And if you see a change in baseline, it can tell you a load about the animal's behaviour. But getting to your point about snow, um, they will do, depending if it's quite deep snow, certain animals might have to, um, that, like a, for example, uh, field voles. Usually I see field voles in a trot. When they're scampering about, they kind of trot along. And mice, like the wood mouse tracks we saw earlier on, tend to, do this um, bounding gait but I have seen say a field vole in deep snow and it can't trot along it would be using its face as a kind of snow plow if it did so it had to bound so that's just one example but it will definitely affect an animal's gait. Also in case I don't uh, in case I forget later on there was a subsidiary question earlier on that I'd skipped over from Nigel Woodall saying that when he's on holiday in Scotland, often see pine martin scat and other nessie. However, lives on the border of Shropshire where pine martins have been recorded in camera traps, in spite of using a dog trained to find scat. That's interesting in itself. None has been found. Any ideas, please? Wow, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, my only, I'd only be guessing, and I, I suspect it's probably just a, um, a question of population. Like I'm sure once the the population there is fantastic that they are there. Once the population starts to grow, you probably just start seeing more scat because in Abernethy, there's a, a good number of pine martins, so which is why we're seeing them, the scats more. So I'd suspect that's the main reason because when they're there, you know, they're as, as I'm sure you'll know um, when you're seeing them, Nigel, is that uh, um, the scats are usually depositing deposited in quite visible places, usually right along the middle of a track. So I suspect that's the reason. Hmm. Judith Bull's wondering when animal hair gets caught on brambles or fences near tracks, can you tell which animal it came from? Yeah, there are ways for sure. There's certain animals that are easier than others. Um, badgers, for example, are really quite easy to sell. The guard hairs on the back of badgers are kind of black with a white bit, a black tip. And if you feel the badger hair, if you roll it in your fingers, you feel that it's not it's not circular in cross section it's more of a kind of oval and it's so it feels like it kind of you can feel that unevenness as you're rolling it and um, foxes will obviously have this reddish fur um uh, rabbits you usually find tufts of rabbit fur actually just dotted around where they've been fighting deer hair is um the guard hairs of deer um, one of the ways you can tell the outer the hairs is that if you try and fold it it creases really easily and it also breaks really easy, it's quite brittle because it's actually hollow for insulation. So, um, and there's other things as well. And there's some things where it's harder to tell by eye and you can even, you can actually tell with a microscope, but those few you can actually tell pretty reliably by eye and by feel. Are you okay for a few more, Dan? Yeah, I'm happy to. I don't know if we'll be able to get through everyone's question tonight, but we'll, you know, keep cracking on for, yeah, El Sapar is wondering: Do roe deer leave rubbing points on trees? They do. Yeah, that's um, that's a really a good bit of roe deer sign to see. You see the males; um, they're basically they're rubbing their antlers, and it's earlier in the season there, as the basically as their antlers are growing up right now, they'll be covered in this velvet, which they they rub off on a um, say on the tree, but they particularly do it as a territorial marking. Um, thing throughout the, the mating season and so they've got scent glands which they'll be rubbing and you usually see it pretty low down to the ground 
like below, say if you're standing by it, um, uh, kind of often around knee high, um, or sometimes below that even, it's right towards the ground where they get their antlers right down in there and rub away at the tree. And sometimes they're really, um, yeah, kind of brutally thrashing the tree. And you'll even see um, marks where they've been scraping their feet as well on the ground. Mariana Cummocks wondering about beaver uh, food preferences. Do, you know, choose cert, do they choose certain trees or specific tree species? They do. They definitely do have preferences. Um, some of the some of their favourite ones are certainly. I mean, aspen is quite well known to be a, a beaver favourite, and they like willow as well. They go. They have a whole a wide range in their diet, but um, aspen and willow are two particular ones. When you think of others, Kenny, that are right up on, there on the list, they're the two that spring to mind most. Well, certainly broadleaves like that, aspen and willow being the two top ones. And I'm always intrigued with the thought that one of the reasons for the beaver's previous demise was because of the amount of salicylic acid from willow that was in their um, anal glands in the castoreum. So it was like one of the main uh, analgesics painkillers that was available to medieval surgeons for example so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely aspen and willow I would put yeah right up there maybe birch does it's in some places but you know broadleaves yeah. preferable preferable to uh, conifers um they're changing in their order sometimes here but catherine henderson wondering is there a way to tell a buzzard kill from a sparrowhawk kill we've seen both birds nearby in their regular kills and it'd be good to know which is which yeah yeah um there's, there are ways to tell. It's not always reliable, but some of the, I'd say some of the, the most reliable ways are actually looking at the prey, prey species itself. So when it's something really small, like, for example, some of the smaller songbirds, it'd be really unlikely for a buzzard to bother with, for example, say a blue tit or even a blackbird. Um, and then when you get to big, and then bigger prey items, and particularly things like rabbits, which sparrowhawks just don't go for, and then, so based on the, the species that's been killed, that's some of the most reliable things. You do get overlap in prey. So the sparrowhawks and buzzards will both eat wood pigeons, for example. And so then it can be trickier to tell for sure. And um, so sometimes then I'd go more on on context. So that's, that's the bit where it's, yeah, can be a bit more ambiguous. But even then I'd look for, say for other signs around, say things like, often around a kill site, I might find droppings, you know, the stripes that we saw. And if it's something really big and quite thick and substantial, I might suspect more likely a buzzard. And there's, there's bound to be other ways as well, but they're the key one. With sparrowhawk plucking post, they, during the nesting season, so when the female is on the nest, the male will be doing most of the hunting, the male sparrowhawk. And he'll tend to have one or two favorite plucking posts. And so that could be a stump or, a, you know, kind of a, a root plate or something of a fallen tree. That will be raised up a bit and often covered in loads of sunbird feathers, and that's a really reliable you know, sign of um, sparrowhawk. And then, and then if you find a plus rabbit, loads of fur around and stuff, you're going to say it's definitely a buzzard if that's your main raptor in the area. I know you've been uh, mentioning a book already with the, the new one just out uh, by John Ryder, but Hel Helen Danielson's wondering if there's anything available that might help to, as a, a book resource to introduce tracking to children. Um, we're running an intro introduction to forest school sessions at my school, and I'm looking to develop a collection to take out into the woods. Oh, okay. Um, there's bound to be, I can't think of the top of my head, there are bound to be resources. There's some good stuff, I think, um, I'm just trying to remember online, maybe one or two resources. Perhaps if you felt like, um, I'll have a think about that. If you felt like you can always contact me just through my website and I'll have a think about specific resources. I can't think of the top of my head. I have seen some, but I can think about some specific ones. I'm pretty sure I know people who have done some resources for kids as well. So if you, if you want, you can feel free to get in touch and I can put you in the right direction. Sarah Gilmore is worried about squirrel memory. Is it true that squirrels forget where they store food? Um, they probably probably forget where they store some. That that general thing about squirrels, they're often portrayed as being kind of quite forgetful and stuff. Generally, isn't true. They've actually got an incredible ability to bury loads of 
bits of food, whether it's um, hazelnuts or other or acorns or other bits of food, and remember an incredible amount. And inevitably, they'll probably forget one or two, or um, maybe even um, get you know they might get killed or die some other way before finding it. And that actually helps certain trees to regenerate. But on the whole, the, the memory is actually really really good. Claire Duffy's wondering why in the early morning um, do I often see little voles dead that appear to have no injuries or sometimes just a tiny little bit of blood? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, um, there could be a lot of, yeah, it could be quite a few different reasons. One thing I see that on more is with shrews, but that's for a different reason, I suppose, because shrews have quite, um, they also have this quite foul tasting, foul tasting, skin apparently tried with it. They, um, uh, so certain birds like owls will just eat them and scoff them and not bothered but certain mammals like cats for example they might try a shrew and actually just have one bite and think forget that and drop it and so it's quite common to find just slightly damaged shrews in the middle of a path with voles um yeah i'm not so sure why that could be it could there's a lot of reasons it could be something that a vole that was killed by something and then the predator was disturbed for some reason or dropped it somehow but I guess it would be more of a case by case thing it's not something I typically see. Rob Lightfoot's really got <clears throat> an observation and you might want to comment that he's seen hoodie crows leaving sites where there are lots of toad skins beside ponds and rivers so he suspects that corvids feed on toads in this manner too. Herons certainly do as our neighbours of a pond and they're seen doing this. Oh, I Brilliant, that's great. I really, I love that. I love them. You know, learning tracks and signs from direct observation is the best way to do it. And so, so it was, I'd be curious if the, the herons were actually, pe I take it they were actually peeling them because I've definitely seen herons hunting for amphibians, for frogs and stuff for sure. I'm just wondering about the, the peeling. But um, yeah, that's interesting. And with the, the crows as well, um, they, yeah, they definitely will eat amphibians and interesting about the, the peeling side of stuff. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Connolly is wondering about witch's broom um, she sees this everywhere in West Scotland is it beneficial to the tree or symbiotic I don't think it is but maybe. yeah I don't think it's either I don't think I'm pretty sure it's not kind of overtly beneficial I don't think it's symbiotic either as far as I know and it's more of I guess technically you'd say it's a parasite but as far as I'm aware as well it doesn't create any kind of um substantial or kind of noticeable damage to the health of the tree and but i think on another on a another level it probably creates a really good micro habitat for all sorts of things a really big witch's broom you probably get smaller birds nesting in there and also a little habitat for insects which will then attract birds as well so um mm. yeah on a, on a bigger picture scale i think it's beneficial in the ecosystem for sure yeah but for the tree i think it's going into the growing tip of things so and it's making cells um you know proliferate in a an inappropriate way um so i think from the tree i mean it's not like this but there have been studies of of the fungus that have been done by people um you know researching cancer for example because some of what is happening in the growing tip is uh not a million miles away to what's happening with the proliferation of you know cancer cells as oh, well really? interesting yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I'm aware time's getting on here, so we'll probably have to draw things to a close pretty soon, but maybe take just a handful more if you're still up for it. Um, Dan, we'll probably need to stop around nine o'clock. Um, Sally Brown saying that if you see digging as if an animal has started digging a burrow like a hole about six inches wide and a few inches deep, is it most likely something digging for food? There are foxes, rabbits and badgers in the places I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's, um, it would probably be something that I'd have to see. I'm just thinking of the size of it. It's quite a typical thing to see, say, with badgers digging for food, for sure, little little spots. I mean, in certain areas, it's even in the woods, you even see a bit of digging that's just been done by a, a dog, but often that's pretty vigorous and you'll see loads of material flown out quite far. So it can be for different reasons, but I'd suspect what you're seeing is most likely something looking for food, quite possibly a, a badger raft or something. I couldn't say for sure without seeing it directly, but that's, that's pretty likely. And Rachel McNeil's wondering what another track might look like. Ooh, oh, nice. Yeah. 
I haven't been. Oh no, actually, I did see something which I was pretty sure was a another track in in Yorkshire, and um, and I have seen slow worm tracks as well. There, um, it's quite hard to describe, but if you imagine it in sand, basically a load of kind of slinky lines, obviously add a width that are kind of writhing along. If you just kind of picture an adder going along, but if you see something, usually it would register best on the sand, just kind of a sinuous trail. Um, hard to describe, but yeah, something like that. And I've seen slow worm tracks nearby. Yep, and uh, something here. I'm wondering whether we need you know, maybe get a couple more. But Ann Sinclair is asking something that I've often wondered about: is why does a pine martin or otter gorge itself? It's particularly pine martin. I think gorge on rowan berries if it doesn't actually digest or absorb much of the berries. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I often ask myself the same yeah. thing. I just think, what's what's going on there? And, and I imagine it's getting something from them. And probably, if not much else, it's going to be getting sugars from the, the berries as well. You know, that's going to be a pretty immediately absorbed um, part of the berry as it's going, th going in. So um, that might be the main appeal for them. Because beyond that, like you say, it, I don't know, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but I imagine it's for the sweetness, even though to actually to our palate, a raw round berry um, is pretty grim and pretty sharp, but it's actually not good to swallow them. They're slightly toxic raw, but um, uh, so that's that's my guess, but it is quite quite uh, interesting why they do that. Mm. Um, maybe you need to make this uh, sadly, about the last question um, from Paddy Zakaria, who was actually the person that asked the first question. So, um, at the risk of giving Paddy two bites at the rowan berry here, but it's an interesting one. I walk on remote paths that I know very well. I see stoat or weasel scats everywhere, but there are places where there are many scats all in the one spot, maybe 15 or so of different ages, but all in the one spot. Sometimes, and this is a good one, it's where a path splits, but also sometimes on a straight path. Why is, why is this? Oh, interesting. Yeah. So with I only just going on my own experience with stoats, scats, I've only tended to find them right near um, a breeding spots, like a, actually say an, an old shed where the stoats were raising their young and there were these kind of middens of loads of stoat droppings all together. And I've, where I am in the places I've tracked, I've tended not to find them out and about in that same way mm -hmm. you describe. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm 100% sure why that would be. But um, and weasels, yeah. and weasels are really, the scats are really tiny and really, really thin, really, really hard to find. But um, stoat scats, yeah, tend to be quite a scarce find in my, my own experience anyway. That's what I was wondering as well about, you know, how confident Paddy is about the identification of the scat. Whereas with the track divide thing, certainly notice that foxes, you know, will like to often put a mark, you know, where you've got a splitting of ways or a, something that's meeting something else. You know, it's quite a yeah, for sure, yeah. Point. yeah, yeah. And in that way, yeah. maybe, I mean, sorry, I no, got. Uh, I was going to say maybe you should have the final question was a kind of wild card one about somebody wondering why. Um, in their experience, foxes like to chew guy ropes on tents. That's a, a very unusual one. Have you ever come across that? Right, fantastic. No, I've never come across that. That's great. I'd love a picture of that for my uh, track and sign collection. But yeah, I'm not, not sure why at all. But interesting one. Yeah. So I'm aware that the questions are still coming in here thick and fast. But I think we'll have to probably leave it at that now. The number of questions is a token of just how fascinating Dan's talk has been and the way that he's self-evidently making so many people start to think about what if, what was that, what's the reason for this, what can I look for type of thing, which is just superb. So I think um, you've really dropped quite a few good pebbles in the pool tonight, Dan, for the people that have been listening, for the hundreds of people that have been present at this event. So I think first off, um, to thank you 
uh, for that, I'll come back to that just in a minute, but also for people that are interested in Dan's work, then do check him out um, online um, and also uh, look, basically Dan Poplet Nature Awareness, if you're Googling it or on Instagram and, and Facebook, hashtag or at Dan Poplet Nature Awareness, you can you know, get keyed in to some aspects of Dan's work. And in normal times, I know he does different workshops in different parts of, of the country. So follow it up, if you will, um, by looking at that online. Um, so basically, I'd like to, to thank Dan a huge amount for all that he shared with us tonight. It's, it's obvious that we've just scratched the surface there. Um, I'd also like to thank Nick and Rashir who've been invisible in the background as the people from uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust head office that have made all this possible. So they're the kind of technical brains behind everything. Uh, thanks to all of you for um, both signing up for this and actually for so many questions. It's frustrating that, you know, basically there's a whole string of questions here that we could keep going through, but um, I think we should let Dan off the hook now. So, Thanks to all of you and thanks especially to Dan for such a fascinating talk. And I hope for a lot of people present, it will also be a really good way to get you out and start looking in fresh ways for tracks and signs and thinking about the evidence. You can see of quite a lot of wildlife that you might not see in person, but if you can find out that it's there, that's really exciting. And Dan's conveyed that to us in huge measure tonight. So. Um, a virtual round of applause to our speaker for, uh, for tonight and uh, thanks to the Trust for um, these series of, of Zoom meetings and on behalf of the North of Scotland SWT group, good night and good tracking. Thanks Kenny, thank you everyone for coming along. <laughs>